George Forba. Um, he is an assistant professor of law at the University of Akron School of Law. In his first career, uh, he was a practicing cardiologist and a medical researcher, uh, and his legal work focuses on the regulation of medical devices and prescription drugs. Thank you. So, in a way, this is the dog ate my homework talk. My colleagues have presented data and findings, and I'm here to explain why I don't have data and findings. <laughs> really, what I'm here to do is to talk about why the data and findings in my area of research often are highly uncertain. So I'm a law professor. I study how the FDA regulates medical devices. Um, how well does it do at keeping us safe? I used to be a cardiologist and a medical researcher. As a medical researcher, I used empirical techniques. As a cardiologist, I saw firsthand how devices can save lives and help people, but I saw how they can malfunction and cause harm and take lives. And I set things up like this for two reasons, right? First is to explain why, to me, using empirical methods in this field is eminently sensible, but also to illustrate a problem that I see in my field. There are a lot of calls to reform the FDA, to reform or even completely revamp how the FDA regulates medical devices. What criteria does it use? What processes does it use? Most of these proposals have not been founded on any solid empirical basis. And so my work really tries to develop an empirical basis for us to understand how well does the FDA do at ensuring that the devices that are approved and marketed in the US are safe? And how well does it do to make sure that they're effective and not um, hamper innovation and so on? And so what I wanna do is I wanna talk about an empirical difficulty that scholars like me encounter as we try to empirically study the FDA. So when we talk about device safety, you'd think it would be easy to figure out whether a medical device is safe, right? It's simple counting. Count up all the times that somebody who's exposed to that device is harmed or killed. Count up all the times that people have been exposed to that device and just divide the first by the second. It's a simple ratio. You do that, you get a percent. Percent of people harmed or killed by that device. Set a threshold, percent higher than X amount, means that device is unsafe, from which you infer that the FDA should not have approved that device in the first place, and that it failed at its mission to ensure safety. If you wanna study overall how the FDA is doing, you do that for all devices and you aggregate it and, and you have your answer. Simple count, and that's where the problem comes in. Counting is not simple. So I set this up as a ratio. Number of people harmed over number of people exposed. So what's the denominator? How many patients have been exposed to a given device? It's often very hard to know. And part of the problem here is that medical devices legally are a very broad, heterogeneous set of products. They range from implanted devices like pacemakers and artificial hips, intraocular lenses, all the way to things like bandages and crutches. And in between products that doctors use in surgery, like scalpels or lasers, products that we use at home, the ubiquitous COVID-19 test being one of them, okay? And for some of these products, we actually have a very good number for how many people have been exposed. Implanted devices are pretty well tracked these days, but for a lot of other devices, we really don't know how many people are exposed, making the denominator hard to determine. What about the numerator? How many people are injured or killed by devices? Here's where we really have problems. Now, there are estimates out there overall, right? There was a 2006 estimate by the FDA that about 2,800 people had been killed that year by medical devices. And incidentally, that about 116,000 had been harmed by medical devices. But we'll start with 2,800. Three years later, an independent research center claimed that there had been over 4,500 deaths caused by medical devices. The consortium of investigative journalists estimate that about over the same time period, 8,300 people a year are killed by medical devices. And so you have an almost fourfold range in estimates just in the number of people who are killed by medical devices each year. But even these estimates themselves are highly questionable. All right, how do we know this? Well, we're reliant on reports, all right? But there are limited duties to report, all right? Who has to report when a device kills someone? Right? Well, the device maker 
as a statutory obligation. If the device manufacturer learns that a person has likely been killed by one of its devices, it has 30 days to report that information to the FDA. Other entities that might know information, hospitals, hospitals and other user facilities have to report potential deaths to the manufacturer, not directly to the FDA. What about doctors? They're in a good position to know. No duty to report. Patients, obviously, no duty to report. And so underreporting of device-caused harm is a well-recognized problem. Estimates about the number, the percent of harm caused by devices that actually report are reported range on the good side, 90%, all the way down on the bad side to 0.5%. And so any attempt to extrapolate the amount of harm, or in this case, death caused by a medical device, is almost impossible to narrow that, right? And so it creates a real problem. So how do we deal with that? Well, researchers like me tend to use a proxy. We tend to look at how many times, how many devices the FDA recalls. So we have to rely on the FDA collecting data from reports and on the FDA's analysis of those reports to tell us when a device is sufficiently flawed that it creates a risk, and we use the highest risk recall, class one recalls, for devices that have a chance of causing death or permanent or long-term serious consequences to health, right? And so we're relying on under-inclusive evidence. But thus far, this has been the best way that anybody has come up with in my field to estimate how often devices that are on the market are truly unsafe. And to conclude on that basis that those devices should not have been approved. And so a lot of the time that I spend when I'm not actually analyzing data, I spend trying to think through this question. What better sources of information can we develop? And so, you know, some thoughts, maybe more robust legal reporting obligations, better and more detailed tracking of all devices. But to date, those of us in the field have unfortunately had to rely on this proxy recalls to get a handle on how many devices are really unsafe. And those many of us, or at least what I do in my work, is I tend to try to use those numbers to say, here's my best case scenario, all right? Relying on this metric, class one recalls, shows me at best, that the FDA at its best. But I have to recognize that the real answer is probably the FDA is not doing as well. And so I just wanna leave you with a couple of takeaways from, from this brief talk. The first is that we actually know very little about the true amount of harm that's caused by medical devices overall, how frequently harm is caused. And anybody who says they have a solid number on this, probably shouldn't believe them. The second is that if we're really gonna think seriously about reforming the FDA, because we're concerned about how well it does to ensure safety, we need to do a lot better at getting this kind of data about device cost harm. Thank you.